I want to I want to uh, kick off um, um, Culture Week talking about longevity, which is kind of I've got a younger crowd here today, so it's I, I, I guess it's a good topic. It's probably a topic that you don't want to wait till you're at the end, you know, to to think about it. So it's like how how do I <clears throat> how do I how do I um, begin well? You know, so, some people never begin. So I commend you all for beginning and going after the plans and the purposes of God in your life. Because many, many are called, uh, but they never step into the chosen. They never step into the calling that God has for them. <clears throat> and then your calling uh, is going to be a journey of life. It's not going to be an instant overnight thing. I mean, there's a reason we're on this earth for all this time. How many, how many are you glad that you just don't have a moment with God and then it's over and you're just sitting there in your rocking chair the rest of your life? <clears throat> there's a reason. There's a reason the will of God doesn't come to us all at one moment. The will of God's unfolded in our life. It, I, I often say it's like links on a chain and he just keeps linking it together because there's a, there's a reason and we're not ready for it. I, I remember uh, <clears throat> Kenneth Hagin saying that he, um, he had been pastoring and, uh, and, and he finally got to the successful church and he, he finally had good food and, and good tires on his car and they could exhale a little bit because it, it had been a rough journey before that, been glorious, but kind of a rough journey and they were kind of entering into success. And <clears throat> he's been pastoring at this time as a young man for 12 years. Uh, and I know Eric and Christina, we just had dinner the other day and celebrated 14 years here on staff with us. These young pups. And then <clears throat> I owe John a dinner because he's been, four, is it 14 too or 15? 14 and 15. Carol, how many? 16. I think it's more than that. I think it's, it, well, maybe, maybe not. And then uh, 23 years. And then Mike and Christine, how many? 20, whatever. Then Mary. Oh, you at dinner probably too, and uh, and um, and so as I look around, Ryan, how long? Six. Six. Okay, you get uh, a potluck uh, with uh, <laughs> with KFC, <coughs> KFC. But but he's been pastoring at this church. And 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 they finally kind of feel like they've they've got some got somewhere, and at twelve years in, and he said something felt wrong, because the will of God keeps unfolding in your life is what I'm saying, and there are seasons with it. Um, in the beginning, when you're young, we're in a we're in a learning season. That that the road's broad for us usually. We, we like, hey, we need you in kids' ministry. Hey, we need you on youth team. Hey, we need you to set up here. Hey, we need you in parking lot. Hey, we need, and, and the road's broad. You're learning. You're flowing. It's good. Don't, don't try to be too restricted with it. Just follow the best you know in your heart. Then you come to your accumulation years. This is where you accumulate and you, you begin to gather things. That's what... That's what um, <clears throat> Kenneth Hagin had just hit his, his gathering years where he was gathering and, and finally hit a little comfort and, you know, um, like I said, good tires on the car and all that kind of stuff. And then from there, you go into your giving away years. You give it all away. You release it. You don't leave this earth. I'm going to read a scripture to you in a minute where Paul, before he left this earth, he was in his giving time, and he says, I'm a, I, am a, I am ready to go. I am a, a drink offering to be poured out. So we leave here being this world different than we came, right? So <clears throat> there's this journey. So he's done this 12 years, 
And he, he said, this is what he said. He said, he, was talk, he, he, he would use this a lot as an example about learning to be led by the Spirit because he, he said everything was good in the natural, but he said it felt like I was in the bathtub with my socks on. Something was just a little bit off. He didn't know what. So it drove him to prayer. And he, he began to fast. And he had his Bible on the altar. And he prayed Ephesians 1 prayer over and over again. Then Ephesians uh, 3 prayer. And he prayed for the eyes of his understanding to be enlightened. He didn't know what it was. Well, it was when God was about to release Rama Bible Training Center, about to release the work in Tulsa, move them from where they were up to Tulsa, and a major shift in his ministry. And he's already a little older. If I'm not mistaken, he was already in his 50s. And God told him, I want you to teach the Word of God. Nobody taught back then. This was probably back in the... 50s or 60s. Nobody taught back then. There was no Bible teachers. They were preachers. They preach. It was you had to have spit coming out. You know, it it was preaching. And he's and God said, I want you to teach the Word of God. I want you to teach my people faith. And he shifted it. And it was it was something that that and and, and he kind of wrestled with that uh, unfolding of the will of God for him because it was something new. And, and when you go with God, there'll always be new seasons and new phases into the will of God. And it's precious. It can be, but he stirs your nest because we can get comfortable. And some of the time he has to stir our nest a little bit. And so he prays and he said, God, we're, we're here. We, we just got the good church. I, I got voted in 100% into this church. Nobody's, I don't have, I got good deacons. They like me. Nobody's fighting. And, and like all of this is good. And, and then he came and, and the, the Lord began to speak to him about doing these all faith crusades. And then the Lord spoke to him. He said, Lord, he, the Lord said to him, he said, son, you are now ready for the first phase of your ministry. He said, Lord, I've been pastoring for 12 years. And he, this is what the Lord didn't fully answer that. He just said, many people live and die and they never step in to what I called them to step into fully. So there's a sobriety of giving God our yes and stepping into um, what we have, and there will be preparation years. There, there may, may be growing years. There'll be accumulating years. Let all of that be fun. Don't put pressure on yourself. God's going to, you know, celebrate what the Lord's doing. Don't put a lot of pressure on yourself. Just walk with the Lord, and I'm going to help you with that a little bit. Um, so <clears throat> many begin, many never begin. Or many never stay with it long enough like Brother Hagin did to really hit into what God called him into. Because, because the more influence you have, the more authority you have, the more, the more Christ-like you have to be in your training and your preparation so we don't hurt people and damage people and, and uh, bring um, d- you know offense to, uh, into Christ or his name or to the body of Christ. Um, but so many don't begin. Many who begin don't finish. And so we've got to learn the art of how do we do this? How do we run our race with patience that is set before us? Consistency. Running our race that's set before us consistently and and. One day we'll find a finish line. That's where I always kind of, I like to tell my story. How many of y'all have heard my story of the race? How many of you have never heard my story? You've been here 14 years, some of y'all, and y'all never heard my story. Ryan, have you heard my story? The finish the race? Yes, you've heard it. Yes, good, good. He's so smart. <laughs> he said yes. He, he doesn't know what I'm talking about, but he's definitely heard the story. And so... <laughs> So, uh, years, years ago, when I was younger, I used to like to, to run, and I went to Austin with Lucy to run a 10K, and, you know, I was a little intimidated because it was going to be a lot more hilly than I'm used to, so I, I set out a good pace, 
And, you know, Lucy's going to be at the finish line, and I, I need to show off a little bit for her. I need her to be impressed with how fast I am and what a skilled runner I am, right? So I know she's going to be there. So I'm running along, and I'm doing great. I was really disciplined, and, and I got a lot left in reserve. And I see the finish line in front of me. So I... I did it. I, I just went. I began to fly like the wind. I just ran. I was like in a hundred yard dash. I'm before long. I'm redlining. <laughs> I'm gasping for air, but I'm going to leave it all You're right when I cross the finish line and there's going to be Lucy and she's going to be so impressed. And so I'm, I'm running past all these people. <laughs> and when I get there, it was not the finish line. The, it was a 90 degree turn. And the finish line is still way off in the distance. <laughs> and I'm already gasping for air. And so there's bush. I'm like, I'm just going to go run in the bushes and hide right now. But the most humiliating thing was I'm now going. <gasps> and I'm like this. And all these people are passing me that I just ran by. And finally, finally, in humiliation, crossed the finish line and the the reality is 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 we have to know where the finish line is Paul apparently knew where his finish line I've always said this is a lot of people think the finish line is when I die the finish line is not when you die the finish line is when you do the will of God Paul couldn't leave this earth till he did the will of God and you and I have the privilege of not just living and dying, but we have the privilege of living and walking with God and doing His will on the earth, no matter what it is. It is special custom design for you, and it is significant to the heart of God, and it is significant to you. So, you and I are continually making eternal decisions that carry eternal reward. And I just believe every one of you will have an incredible journey and you will have adventures in God and you will uh, not just leave this earth, but you will pass your baton to the next generation and they will run uh, with your children will run and your family will run with the glory of God in, in greater ways than than you may have in your life. So, we have a problem in Christianity, in the ministry, in the formal ministry right now, of uh, people leaving the ministry. They began, they're leaving, um, and part of it is just the professional culture of ministry that we find ourselves uh, in today is really not sustainable. What is it, uh, Pastor Jimmy, you know, may know better than me. It's like 1,100, 1,200 pastors leave the ministry every week. Um, and some of it's generational. Some of it is retiring. And again, I think we have another real problem where we work somewhere and even for a generation, but then we, we come to our finish line and our finish line shouldn't be the finish line for the church or the body of Christ, the people we're walking with. They should keep running with their journey. But what's happening a lot in the church is the churches will just close because everybody got old and they weren't walking together. So uh, we, have, um, uh, we have talented, anointed men and women of God crashing and burning because of the model of ministry we have that has so much pressure, so much isolation that's on the man of God to pull the rabbit out of the hat, to be the greatest, you know, the, the greatest oracle. Some of these guys I can't even watch because of the pain 
and the intensity and and the things that uh, are surrounding them, that, it, that it's got to be a Hollywood production every time. And I'm not casting stones. I'm actually quite compassionate. We have to decode this thing, and we have to help the body of Christ, men and women of God, not burn out and, and have longevity uh, because that model uh, uses you, abuses you, uh, many times you end up in pain, you end up in emotional pain, you can end up in sin, you can end up in humiliation, you end up uh, broken relationships, you end up with all kind of things that, that, that it's just, uh, and these are our best and our brightest. These are, these are wonderful, wonderful people. No, listen, no, you know, usually it's not a bad person who wants to be in ministry. These are most people who want to be in ministry are the cream of the, the cream. They're amazing people. And, but what happens is we get in isolation. Uh, they they, they uh, have pressure. They get burned out. And so that's why we are doing everything we can to try to shift this and help us walk in a realm of longevity for both the public church for the longevity of the public church and for the joy of the ministry that is set before us, for the upward calling that we have in Christ. And we have to, we have to bring it back to the ministry is not a production, the ministry is the face of Jesus. And we have to bring it back to his presence is the wind. Him in the room is the wind. <clears throat> and listen, if you get that, people won't care if you're in a barn. If he's in the room, they don't care. If you're in a barn, um, I mean, it's nice to have air conditioning, but, but you know, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll do whatever they've got to do to get in the room if he's in the room. And so we have to change this whole perception. I'm going to help you with that a little bit today. So the first thing I would say for longevity uh, and all, most all of these things you've heard me say a time or two, but I'm, I'm just going to go back and hit it again um, with things. But uh, number one, if you're going to have longevity, is that you have to have, you, you know, don't ever let the ministry be professional. Uh, you have to have a sincere inner life. And the inner life always has to be bigger than the public life. The inner life always has to be bigger um, than the inner life. So the inner life becomes your inner fulfillment, your inner treasure. And so your, your, um, your win with the inner life is not a destination. Now that's one of the things that will make you in miserable in ministry is when your inner life is all focused on a destination. When am I going to get the bigger crowd? When am I going to get a bigger building? When am I going to get a bigger, you know, song release? When am I going to get a million followers? When am I going to get this or that? When, when you're all focused on a destination rather than a person, we have to have the rhythm of the inner life and and never, never let your, you know, it gets interrupted at times. We travel, we get tired, but you have to find the rhythm of the inner life and sustaining the inner life uh, because you can, you can work so hard at preaching that the Bible becomes work. And then you just go into the Bible to get points. Oh, snap, I can download an outline actually these days. I got AI that'll do it for me right now. And then, you know, it's, it's, it's work. This is not work. This is, this is, this is um, a, a journey, and the destination is, and, and I'll give more definition to this, but it's, it's not an outward destination. It's, it's him. If I got him, I'm home. If I got him, I'm successful. If I got him, I'm good. And really, folks, this, it, 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 it sets you free. Because this world 
runs on destination mentality. This world is programmed. Everything you get bombarded with to buy, everything you get bombarded with in appearance and everything, it's all about big and success and destination and you got to look like this and and you watch certain movements again i'm not throwing stones i'm I, i'm a actually love these love people very much and people could say the same thing about us but you get in a certain destination mentality people want it so bad they they dress exactly like the leader they, they there's you know we lose individuality we um we all are, are just being pressed into this destination. I gotta drive this kind of car. I gotta live in this kind of neighborhood. I gotta do this. Hey, wait, wait, take all that off the table and why don't you just let it be a journey and let the destination be pleasing the Lord and the heart of the Lord and, and that living, vibrant relationship. I heard uh, Bill Johnson, he says so many good things, but I heard him say, uh, uh, something that really marked me and I'm like okay this is this is this is powerful and that is he said you know it's a it is a scary thing to show up and to walk on a platform where you have more uh, favor than you have anointing so I'm just saying to you if it's destination mentality, like I got to get to the top of the mountain, then all kind of things come in. I'm gonna, I, I, I might even elbow somebody out of the way. Like the, the, you, there's a price tag on you. And the devil knows how to push buttons. He's, he's a pro at it. Because he, he, he went to the top of the mountain. I'm going to sit on the throne of God. And so, th did you notice the devil tried to buy Jesus? Tried to buy him. Tried to end, end his ministry. And none of us would have been saved. And can I tell you a sobering thought if you're called? Sobering thought. You being in your assignment, doing the will of God, in union with him... People's destiny, eternal destinies, are going to be marked by that. Now, God will find somebody else to go do it, I think, if we flake out. But the intent is that he uses you, and forever, some children are changed, some children are marked, some youth are marked, some people are marked in worship services for eternity, right? Right? <clears throat> so he, the devil tried to buy Jesus and said, I know what you're after, destination. I know what you're after. And I got it. I got the mountains. I've got media. I've got fame. I've got money. I've got finances. i got it all. And, and what, that, but, but that wasn't what Jesus was wired with. What was Jesus wired with? What was his destination? What I see my father do and what I hear my father say. Bringing pleasure to his father. So he wasn't for sale. He wasn't for sale. And we'll be tested in these ways. Um, and, um, you know, if, if the big stage comes one day, like if God chooses to use you in that way, I, I got to say... Big and little, I gotta say, the little stage, some of the time is more attractive. Like, I promise you, you go find something more special than what we just stepped into in Japan. That's holy. When I got to Canada, they'd all heard about Japan already. And, and as we walk this out, it's not about, it's not about that. It, it is about the inner life. And so I've taught y'all a lot through the years about getting the rhythm of your inner life, maintaining your inner life, knowing when, okay, I'm vulnerable right now. I'm vulnerable because I just poured it out. 
So I, I am made to be dependent on needing him and his presence. So I need to grab a cup of coffee and I need to sit here and I need to talk to the Lord. And I don't need to do a sermon. I don't need a children's outline. I don't need the next children's skit. And I, I don't need, you know, the next thing. I, I need union with the one that I, that, that, that it means everything to me. And then um, <clears throat> learn the filling of the Spirit in your personal life. Not for ministry, not to try to get an anointing, not to write the next hit song. Learn to woo the Lord. Learn to have one scripture a week that you're just sucking honey out of it. And every time you do, you get a deeper measure. And learn the, how the, the wind of the Spirit will come on your head and it will whoosh, it'll go in your spirit. Now, I, I know an apostle in Mexico, Annie, who was a... <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to describe her. <laughs> she is a Catholic nun that turned an upper room into a literal upper room, and they all got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she started churches all over. She's one of the greatest ministers I've ever met. And every morning, she would sit there, and she's the first one years and years ago started teaching me the inner life. Because I was, I was crispy. And she started just teaching me the inner life. And, and she go, why do you let things between you and the Lord? The Lord doesn't let things between you all. In other words, why do you feel like you failed and now you've, you're separated? Why do, you, why do you feel like you weren't perfect and he doesn't want? Why do you let things between him? He doesn't. And then she would say, every morning you need a drink of the Spirit of God. And just sit there. And she said I, she would just start humming or singing. And she would close her eyes. And she would start loving on the Lord, telling him she, ne he, she needed him. And then she said, and, and, and it's true. And many of you probably experienced it. It comes different ways. I've, I've actually had it do it in reverse before. But the next thing you know, you become aware of his realm and it begins to almost, the best way to say it, dance around your head. And the next thing you know, it'll be like a wind will go in you. And it's like you just took the biggest drink of living water. And she says, when that happens, you're ready for the day. You're now ready for the day. So we have to learn the art of the inner life, the walk, the creativity, the book, the song on repeat that keeps you connected to him and his reality bigger uh, and our dependence on him and love on him. I'm, I've been wrecked by something recently. I'll just give mention to it. I'm not really ready to preach on it. I preached on it a little bit, but not on, on any, any way. I'm asking the Lord to, to teach me and show me more. But I, I am wrecked by... Um, the romance heart of the Lord. And how that through the years, he has romanced me through valleys, um, wars, uh, discouragement, that he, uh, uh, he'll come along and he will, he's amazing. He will come along and he will romance your heart. And he's very much a romantic. And we have to have that part. We have to come out of the, the Song of Solomon says, who is this coming up out of the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? And we have to understand that's the way times we come out of difficulties and situations because he romanced us out and we come out leaning on our beloved. And that's something you just never want to lose. That's why he's taking us into the worship realm. 
That's why he's taking us into the glory realm. He's clothing his bride with glory. And, and folks, that, so it's not a destination. It is a person. It is, it is that. And we have to break this mold of ministry that has made it anything else. Yes, of course, we're productive. Yes, of course, we do other things. But it becomes more. So in, in, in that shift, you find identity. And this is one of the reasons people wear out and quit is because they're working for identity. I'm working for the identity of success. I'm working for the identity of notoriety. I'm working for the identity of, um, so we feel good about ourselves, right? Like, gosh, everybody wants to be successful. Everybody wants to do something that others recognize as, is something good. But, but that's not how you go about it. You, you do not work for identity, you work out of identity. You work out of identity, you work from identity. Identity is something you will never earn. It is something you are given, and it is something that becomes a revelation to you in the secret place. So your identity in those moments, in those times that is set in you is sonship. Like, okay, like my kids, I don't think they wake up in the morning and say, okay, I got to go earn being a son. Right? I got to earn this. No, they wake up a son. They wake up and go. And then they, you know, they know I'm good for something, you know, if they need it along the way or whatever. And um, so it's sonship. So you, you, you're, um, you don't... Everybody, and here's the, the, the problem, and maybe I'm, I don't, I don't want to be negative, but, but everybody, most everybody's got an agenda for identity. Yeah. Church staffs included. Yeah. Like they're working, and they got an agenda that they don't even realize, and it's for identity, yeah. and, and that's what causes conflict. True. How different would it be if we started the day every day knowing I'm righteous, I'm accepted, I am a son, and I am a daughter, I am the beloved, I, I, I have had my encounter with him. What that does is set you free to walk, your identity is set, you don't have to earn it, and you are free to serve at that point, you're free to give it away, you're free to encourage, you, you encourage others, you're free to see other people in your world, because uh, we're not striving for this destination, and all of that comes out of the the um, the uh, uh, identity of sonship. So Jesus is our example, and obviously, what he did is, you know, before he ever did one miracle, the father bragged on him. Father bragged on him and said, "This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased." Hear him. Right? So how did Jesus live? He lived in the power of his identity and his inner life with the Father. And all he had to do was be faithful. You, you realize you don't have to do the miracle. All we need to do is just be faithful in the stewardship of our sonship and what he called us to do. Just be faithful. Be faithful to him. Um, talking about Bill Johnson again, another one, another story I just really just think is so profound and so against Christian culture. Somebody was talking to him about, they were interviewing him, and it might have been Michael, I can't remember, but they were interviewing him uh, and talking about, you know, his transition from Weaverville, this little bitty town, to, you know, this big successful church in Reading and, and worldwide notoriety and all this. And they're like, man, you were really like laying into that, believing, um, like going for it. Like you finally stepped into your, your destiny. Like, and he goes, no, no. He goes, I was perfectly content to spend the rest of my life in Weaverville and just be faithful under what the Lord had. 
Because he wasn't looking for a destination. He was, he was walking in what he had. And, but, but I will tell you that, that in, in that identity, you can give, you can serve purely, but you can also um, be faithful. Because your reward is not the destination. Reward <laughs> is the king of glory. <laughs> he knows you by name. He comes in your room. He rides in your car with you. That is the reward. Don't let anything be the reward beyond the Lord. Now, we enjoy things. Things happen. Wow, this is awesome. We, we, we're blessed, but you, you know, when, when things come along, uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm telling stories, but uh, John Osteen, I remember, marked me as a young man. Here's this big, fancy church back then. This would have been in the 80s. I don't know why everything seems so, <laughs> like, way back in the 80s now. It's like, But um, <clears throat> I remember got all this success, all this stuff. And I remember he, he, would, he, he had his little finger, and he, he was only 5'7", and he, he would hold the finger up, he'd go like this, or he'd go like this. You know, he, like he'd talk, and he'd go, I'll tell you what. And, you know, Dodie Osteen is his wife. So I'll tell you what. Dodie and my bags are packed. And we're ready to go pastor the city dump tomorrow if the Lord tells us. In other words, he was, he was moving with the Lord. He was moving with, with, uh, with the heart of the Lord. And, and that was a destination. Um, you know, I, I, go, I go back and I said this uh, a lot. But I go back and I think, some of the greatest encounters have been in the most unfancy places. And some of, the, some of the biggest crowds have been the most disappointing. Most of, I mean, I've had a few encounters with the bigger crowds, but it's kind of rare. Most of the time, it's in the outback somewhere, or some nation, or some... Japan or some place you don't expect where you just are walking with the Lord. You're journeying with the Lord. And, and he has included you in that. So you're working from sonship. So never let the outer life become bigger than the inner life. And, um, um, you know, just become aware of these things. If, if we're all working for destination, our outer life, and our position, then your environment leadership, your environment as a staff will become competitive. It will become uh, full of strife. There'll be high turnover. Um, there will be a lot of offense. So we have to learn this is, this is a completely different journey. A second thing, <laughs> got a, whew, we got stuck on number one, didn't we? But how many believe we got to shift it? We got to shift it, right? And I think God's using you guys to shift it. And, and I'll tell you, being in the dwell room with the Lord, it'll shift, it'll shift you. It'll shift you because you learn to value. Wow. There were three people in the room, and the Lord came. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it'll, it'll shift your life. So the second thing I want to say for longevity is, you know, don't go alone. Don't go alone. Um, you and I are going to have to learn the skill of doing life with people and do it with people for a long time. And one of the things that I so love is that um, we, and I'm, uh, how, do, how do I say this? You know, because people's assignments are different at times, and some are a little shorter, a little longer. But I, I love that we get to do life together a long time, 
I love that we get to do life together and, and have, have time with each other and, and do that. So I meet too many ministers that, around the world that are walking alone, and I tell them, you need to find family. You need to quit walking alone. You need to find, um, you, know, you know the gift of family, right? You know the gift of, of a love environment, a presence environment, is that you don't have to be spectacular. You get the gift of being loved unconditionally. So what that means is, is we're all going for Him. And as we go for Him... We are cheering for each other and we celebrate when we take a risk to step out in faith for him. And we're like, wow, you did that. Or we go, wow, there's a grace on your life for that. You need to, you need to lead. You need to go. And we begin to do life together. And one will put a thousand, two will put ten thousand to flight. It is exponential in the power of doing life as a family um, or doing life together. Um, in, in, I, back in the 90s, or actually in the 80s, we began, you know, we used to only recognize in the body of Christ really uh, pastors and evangelists. Right, the evangelists we only saw two weeks out of the year, and I, I, I didn't have a lot of history with that, but in the short time I was in denominational churches or whatever, that was kind of the way it was. You probably have more history with that than I do, but, but we didn't recognize, you know, the prophet. We didn't recognize teacher. We, we didn't even know what an apostle was, <laughs> like, you know. We knew, the, we knew the apostles of the Lamb, but we didn't know there were still apostles today. They may not be in the order of the apostles of the Lamb, but there are apostles today. And so what happened is, let me, let me give you a little, a little help with something. Again, where you guys are going to have the burden of shifting some cultures. In my day, a powerful leader was could be very isolated but they're very territorial i'm just going to call it for what it was and i'm going to call it out and say it's wrong because they they were not fathers so you will meet some generals that are just a general and the way i say it probably not a very appropriate way to say it but they have a high body count there's going to be people left because it's costly you're going to get burned out, used up, whatever. And I'm giving voice to this stuff because I'm talking to leaders where you're going to do things differently. Amen? You're going to know things differently. So our guys, if they, like, you got too anointed or they thought you were ready to start a church or you made a mistake and told them you were going to start a church, you, your bags were packed and you were put, you were shown the door. And that, that was the culture they had in that day. This is my pulpit. I'm going to go to heaven behind this pulpit. There won't be any transition here. I'm going to die on the platform if I want. You know, it was that kind of... It was that kind of thing, and honestly, you know, it was. And they didn't, they weren't modeled anything different. We weren't modeled anything different. So all we knew was a very individualized ministry, uh, a very individualized, there's the one man who's the super anointed for the healing, and, 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 and all the pressures on him, and he's got to lay hands on everybody. He's got to do it all, this one, whatever. And that's how we were raised. That's how I was raised. That's what we knew as normal. And I'm just telling you that, that one of the greatest kingdom words and definitions that kingdom is a family. And that God is a family God. And he wants us, and you know, we're called, we call each other brothers and sisters. <laughs> and so, um, while there may be order and, and, and there may be uh, levels for the purpose of a position, um, we have to learn to walk together. And I really encourage you guys 
to do this, to, to celebrate one another. And so that's where we kind of came up with this, the, 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 you know, the mountain. I've given you all an example. What the way I, I was raised was the, the senior leaders at the top of the mountain. And then you hire everybody to do a job. And everybody's a little block, you know. And, and you, you, you may not talk to them. You don't have any relationship with them. And they have a job description, and they need to get in there and do their job. And they're just sat there in that place, and, and they're, they're serving. So, again, I, I don't mean this all to come across like whatever, um, uh, come across strong, but I, I want to I help us with longevity in churches, longevity in ministries, longevity and in, in all of those things. So... Um, there are cultures even today that they, they, they don't, they're not doing ministry with family, they got servants. And, and that's, that's the way they do ministry. Now, that's up to God to deal with that or whatever, but I don't want servants around me. I want sons, I want daughters. That's the reward. I want, I, I feel like, you know, I, I love my my sons and my daughter-in-laws, but it really, in a way, in, in the spirit realm, you're all my sons and daughters, and I claim all of you. And, and, and that's the way I feel about the world, and that's the way I feel about the nations, and I'm delighted if they call me dad. So some generals are not fathers at all, but some fathers that there, there are some fathers that are generals that, that are relational like that, and God's releasing more and more of them. So what happens in this kind of structure where you kind of got the king of the mountain mentality is um, what happens is that everybody has dreams and purposes and callings, and, and, and you want to go with the will of God, and, and here... You're you're there, but but in the in so in this we call a quiver, where we try to serve, and everybody keeps going, but you don't have to break relationship. In this model, um, this guy finally has enough, and he leaves and goes and starts his own mountain. The moment he does that, all relationship is broken with the previous. And we keep doing this all over the world over and over again, and we got to change it. And that is that, that we, we go low to release that which is in another. Now, I will tell you, um, having had, we've had staff here for years and others, and I will tell you, um, there are moments where our assignment changes in that. There are moments when our position changes, and we all have to be willing to follow the cloud. We all have to be willing to follow the anointing, and that's where we stay in alignment as we follow Him. And, you know, the, the, the position, the title, those things change, but we stay in that, that relationship. So I would say that uh, one of the things that I saw was when this apostolic wave started coming, was that these guys, many of them would have big churches, but they're traveling. And they're like, okay, well, I can't travel, and I can't church, and I can't... Nobody, nobody understood how to do this. So what they did, tragically, is they left their family. And they started traveling, because that's what they're called to do. So they went, and they traveled... And they had success, and they did things. But in about five to ten years, all of a sudden, they're out there all alone. They don't have any team around them. They don't have anybody that's going with them. They have no sons and daughters that have been, not because they're bad people or, or, or tried to do something wrong. I just tragically watched this happen with some people I was friends with. And, and so what the Lord spoke to me is that it's an assignment on the house. It's an assignment on the family. Do it as a family. Do it together. Take people with you. Go. You know, and, and, and you don't have to be the only one who prays. And you don't have to be the only one who ministers. And you don't have to be the only one. Learn to do it together as the Lord leads us and directs us 
So that, you know what I found out? It's a blast. It is a blast. You're not out there alone. You got friends, you got family with you. We have, we have fun in the services, and we have fun after the services, and, and, and you, you, you got a whole team of people praying and prophesying. You touch a bunch of people. Sure, there might be time where you, you need to do it because that's what the Lord wants at that moment, but we began to do it together, and um, it was powerful because it's, impar- it's imparting into other generations. And then what happens is suddenly a team goes and you don't even have to be with them. And then another team. You know, in May, in May we, did, um, we did three besides May match for the orphanage. We did three international trips. So... That means you got home team worshiping, and that level can't drop. Nothing can drop here, because that wouldn't be right. So that anointing has to be the same here. So you got to be preaching. You got to have a full worship team. You got to be taking care of people. That's got to be going. And then we had a team in Japan, like I've said a couple of times. And then you know, you're investing in that. Then you got family there with them. And then, then the next thing you know, you're in Canada with another team. And then it's still got to be going here. Oh, wait, while you're in Canada, uh, Eric flew back from Paris with the interns. He was so jet lagged. He flew back from Paris with the interns. And you got the interns over there. And the interns were more powerful than all of us. And they were, they were like going, and that's all we could heard about was the interns. And suddenly, suddenly a family is carrying something together for the glory of God uh, that becomes very beautiful and very attractional. And so it, it, it's amazing. I, I want to read the scripture, Luke chapter 5. A- actually, I didn't. I didn't read the first scripture. Let me read it. It was 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. I should have read this. Um, this is, this is uh, Paul speaking in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. He said, For I am al- I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and my time and my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. What the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but all those that love is appearing. So that was kind of the overall arching. But I want to read Luke chapter 5 real quick. And I'll, I'll just have to crash land this. I have, I have just as many more points to go that I have not made it to. Luke chapter 5, verse 3 through 7 Um, This is where Jesus got in Peter's boat. And it says, "Then, Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little bit from land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said, Simon, launch out into the deep and let down Um, your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said, Master, we've toiled all night, caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking, so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. So I love this. I love this story. It began with an individual. It began with a, a journey uh, into the heart of God, um, quite innocently by Peter. Jesus got in his boat, called him, sent him out, and that's the amazing thing uh, uh, about the Lord is He's such a rewarder. You know, He didn't just use His boat. And like I'm done, he, the, the blessing began to flow. And so Peter, you know, puts down the net. And what I like there, at the, at the beginning, nobody else was there. 
And as a leader, what we have to learn to do is share our calling with people that God puts in it. Because the thing is, is in the beginning, they might not have been in your living room when you got the, the word. Or they may not have been in the dream when you got the word. You know? Uh, besides Jeff, Chris, John was born 20 whatever years ago. You, you weren't there. Just, these guys were there. This was the first, first sound man, first graphics man right there. And uh, almost blew it up. And um, we've come a long ways, John. Come a long ways. And so the thing was that with the harvest was so big that he needed partners. So he had partners he could call to. And when the partners came with their boat, everybody's boat got loaded to the sinking point. So it didn't matter that the partners maybe weren't there at the beginning of the story. What mattered is they were there when the Lord needed them. And, and this journey, so, so the thing is, like all of you guys right now, your boats are going to be loaded to overflowing, to sinking, right? You're called into it with the Lord. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't matter when it started. It matters that God puts you together and you, you and I, for the sake of the harvest, need each other. We need other churches. We need other relationships uh, to where we can call to and we walk together. So what happens is, as you become leaders and God gives you responsibility, so what happens is if beautiful tapestry, probably at the beginning of the day, none of them obviously knew this was going to happen. None of them had an understanding about what was going to happen. But it was relationship that got the harvest in. It was relationship that kept it from spilling. And so what happens is, is you begin to walk in each other's dreams. You begin to walk in and out of each other's assignments. You begin to... Like, you, you began as individuals, but all of a sudden your boats are partnered together and everybody's got fish and, and it's overflowing, the harvest is coming in. So, you can't finish alone. Simon's journey started singular, but he had to have people, he had to have partners, he had to have people for the sake of the harvest. So I look back, and I, I have to say that's one of the most rewarding things, is I, I, I look back and I, I look around, and, and everybody shared the harvest. Everybody got the harvest. And I, I look around, I remember years ago, um, I had a dream, and I saw a glass building, like a three or four story glass building and it was like across the street and it had written on the name uh, on the side of it, it was a church and on the side of the church was written one thing open heaven one thing open heaven and then on this side of the street was our building but it looked exactly like that building but we were dwelling place. And we were, we were doing our dwell time. We were doing our stuff. And um, um, all of a sudden I realized our conference, like our 10C conference that we do, all of a sudden I realized I had to tell all you guys, guys, we're going to work just as hard as we work for 10C conference. We're going to work and serve just as hard for a conference, but it's not our conference. We're going to give it away. 
They're going to use our building. We're going to use it away, give it away, but we're going to serve it like it's ours. So about that time, the pastor from that church was going to come and meet me. And for some reason, you know how crazy dreams are. For some reason, this, uh, this guy comes walking, walking in and, and he says, this is Pastor Randy. He can have anybody speak. He wants to have speak, including Randy Clark. It's just what it said in the crazy dream. And I sat down, introduced, and was going to do this. Then the scene changes, and I'm in a suburban, and I'm talking to Michael Kuglianis. And we're, he's on a cell phone talking to someone, and we're conversing back and forth. And I realized then, after that, they approached us and said, we want to do our regional Jesus image meetings here at your church. And we were prepared. And we served, they, they showed up thinking they were going to have to do stuff. They showed up and they said, y'all did everything. And we're like, yeah, we did. Because we're partners. We're partners. All we have to do is serve you. We don't have to worry about our fish. Just serve it. Everybody's boat's going to get filled and fill up. And, and that's when I told him, I said, Michael, I saw the name, and it was one thing, open heaven. It was one thing, one thing, and the open heaven. And for years, we served that. For years, we went after it, never gave it all away, never charged a penny. Are you kidding me? Are, you, are we crazy? Would never. Love, serve. They would look at us like, let us do something. I'm like, no, you can't. We get, to, we get to do this. We get to serve this. We get to do it. And so what happened now, 13 years later, is you, you look back and you realize, you know, I'm walking in their dream and they're walking in my dream. And everybody's dream is coming to pass. So I look around the room and I see people here and we're walking in each other's dreams. Our kids will know each other. Our, our churches will know each other. We'll, we'll have miracles together. And it's one of the most beautiful things in the unweaving and the unfolding of the plan of God. And... I really, to leaders watching or leaders here, um, learn to give your boat, and it'll get full. Learn to give your boat. Don't make everybody pay for your boat. The, the partners didn't sit on the shore and say, we're tired, what's the contract? They hadn't seen any harvest yet. How much are you gonna pay me? And I'm telling you, you, you're canceling miracles. Just count it as seed and let God uh, do what he wants to do uh, with, with people. And I think we've probably gotten more. I mean, I know they've gotten blessed in the transaction, but I think we've probably gotten more. I think we've probably gotten more. And, you know, of course, I walk with them in other ways. But um, you have history, you have stories before long. You're sitting around the table laughing. He has stories on John I don't even know about. He has stories on Ryan. You know, he still calls and says, Ryan, tell the story when Rev prayed for you. You know, like we're all in tears laughing. And before long, this whole tapestry of this life of... of uh, sharing together so my apologies i did not get to the full i didn't finish the message on longevity <laughs> i only made it halfway on my journey of longevity with you <laughs> i didn't know the message was going to be a long message a long longevity anyway come on pastor jeff i love you guys